piece so that I, when I clamp, it'll squeeze against the piece. Just, you know, one by quarter vertical so that it's welded, welded right against in it. there. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I've got a couple things I need to mention. Um, I'm deaf in my right ear. I cannot hear. So if you have a question, speak up and then raise your hand or something because it's weird that when you lose your hearing, Clay might be able to relate to this. You have no idea where the sound's coming from. So somebody back here could ask, and I'm looking out here to see where you're at. So um, we'll work with that. When uh, I was asked to demonstrate here, I thought, well, I wonder if I'm going to be nervous. But look at that. That's steady as a rock. But of course, this is my hammer hand. <laughs> so we're going to try to do our best today. So it really is an honor to be here. I do have some stories about Francis. Maybe I can start with one. There's some that I haven't shared with anybody, and I probably won't share with you all today, but I may have some interesting stories. Um, Gordo came down to a living history site that I worked at in Littleton. And what year was that, Gordo? 87, 88. And through Gordo's friendship, I had heard about Francis because I was hired to work at this um, living history site because I knew how to... 95, 96 because I knew how to farm with draft horses and oxen. And so that's why I was hired to work at this place. Well, they had a smithy, and so soon thereafter, the director asked me if I'd be interested in learning how to smith. And I said, you know, I've, I've put shoes on horses, but I've never done any blacksmithing. So uh, when he went in and started the fire, probably happened to a lot of people in this room. Once he started that fire and heated up a piece, then I knew I was hooked. So um, then later, Gordo came along, and that's through Gordo I was able to meet Francis, and then I came up here, and I was in way over my head, and Gordo said, oh, you'll have no trouble. You'll have no trouble. And um, sometimes I'm kind of a smart ass, so you can imagine how that worked with Francis. So we, had, we locked horns a few times where he, I shouldn't say locked horns, but he put me in my place more than once. Um, and then we came up at one conference. He had, he had gone to... Um, He'd gone to the uh, opera down in Santa Fe with his girlfriend. The conference started on, people came in on Wednesday just like they do here, and then he came in on Friday evening. And so when he walked into the shop at that time, those of you that were here, I bet you, you'll say this is accurate, that when Francis walked into the shop, everybody got quiet. Guys that were forging, all of a sudden, they kind of wandered out of the shop. People that were drinking beer left, and then nobody was smoking in the smithy. And so Francis came over, and I was over at the forge that was over there, and I was working on doing a collar weld around a stake tool to go in the hardy. So I was getting ready to do a big weld. Francis walked in, and I gave him a hug, and then I you know, told him it was good to see him again. And then he proceeded to sit down right next to my forge. And he, was, he sat down, he was just like this, looking at me, and he was about that far away, and I thought, oh, I wish he would move to go do something else. <laughs> So then I was teasing him. I said, Francis, I think I hear your phone ring, and I think somebody needs you. Or then he would just sit there, and he wouldn't even blink. He'd just look at me. And, and I said, I think Gordo is calling you, Francis. And he didn't even make a reaction to that. So um, I went ahead, and I got lucky, and I got the weld. And then because I was feeling good, I, I had a hammer that the next day he was doing a demo. And I said, Francis, tomorrow on your demo, would you mind hardening and tempering this hammer? And he said, if there's time. So I said, all right. So then the next day, he started, and he did, a, he did, somebody asked to do a demo, and he did, and then he looked around the room, and he said, somebody said something about hardening and tempering a hammer. And, uh, and I, I was over there in the bleacher. I said, here, that's me, Francis. I started handing it, and he said, don't hand, don't hand that to me. You bring it to me. <laughs> and I went, uh-oh. 
And so I came walking up to him and I stood by him and he looked at that hammer and he proceeded to just tear it apart and tear me apart and I'm just standing here, you know, shaking my head. And if you, you can rent that DVD, by the way, and it'll make you cringe because he is just tearing me up. The next conference, by the way, I was over in the uh, cafeteria and there was a guy standing behind me that I didn't know. And, I overheard him saying, he said, whatever happened to that guy that Francis ripped into last year? He said, man, I felt so bad for that dude. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm kind of... So during that conference where he tore into me, um, at the night before I'd made a pair of tongs, and I was over here, and I think Clay, is Clay here? Yeah. Were you part of this? No, when I put... Numbers. Okay. So I made a pair of tongs, and I was getting ready to set the rivet. And there was a uh, demonstration going on. And so I was getting ready to put it together. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to tease Francis. So instead of putting them together the right way, however that is, I put them together like this. And I was getting ready to set the rivet. And I told, I thought it was Clay, but I told whoever was there, I said, could you go get Francis and tell him Andy needs some help? He's, he's got a question. So I was... I was sitting there, setting that rivet. And Francis walked over. And I held that up and I said, Francis, I can't figure out what I did wrong. <laughs> and he held that thing up and he looked at that and he looked at me. And then he started giggling like a little girl, I swear he did. <laughs> I swear he did. And then. Then he stopped the person that was demonstrating and he walks in front of everybody and he says, look everybody, this is the mistake of the conference and Andy Morris is the one that made these. <laughs> and I was thinking, it was a joke, it was a joke. But I let him have his fun. So, he what? Up to folks, when somebody did something wrong, ring the bell. Everybody come over here. Yeah, so he didn't ring the bell that day, but I made these last night. Uh, I made these last night, and I figured I would put those together wrong and commemorate Fran that moment that Francis and I had together. Maybe we can put them on the wall. Those, by the way, the ones I made were up on the wall, but somebody must have somebody must have borrowed them. They must have been pretty famous, I guess. So, but I really had some wonderful times with Francis. I had received a grant to go to England. Actually, Mark Asprey and I went, and Francis paid for my way to go there. And I think I was the only person, at, I know at that time, that he used his funds to, uh, from the Francis Whitaker Blacksmith Education. Educational Foundation. Um, I sent in all the paperwork and all, and he, uh, he funded that. And that was really an eye-opener for me. And then another time, I came up here and worked with him, and I made a set of um, balcony railings. And then after that one, uh, he let me come back up and we made a bunch of tools. So I remember the first time when I was working with him, of course he was living over there in that house, and I got here super early and I was sitting there waiting and I stood on the corner of the shop because I didn't think I should go up and knock on his door and then he came over and, and I go, good morning Mr. Whitaker, and he said, you can call me Francis. And I said, okay, and so we came in and then he opened up my packet of information and my scale drawing and all that stuff. And, and he said, this is the most complete set of papers that anybody's ever done. And boy, did I feel good. And I said, you're kidding. And he looked at me and said, no, I'm not kidding. You know, he was so, so direct. And I learned pretty quick he didn't say something like that anymore. So um, we proceeded to work making that railing. And as another story just came to mind. His, his little desk was over here in that phone, and I don't know, is that still the same phone we're hearing ringing once in a while, or not? I don't think so. Okay. But I, on this railing, I had 80 forge welds to do. So as I was doing these welds, I was getting splattered, and my shirt was full of holes, and my, the hair was off my arm, and things were going pretty well. And on one forge weld, every time you did this weld, it would splatter. And I was finishing the weld. I remember Francis saying once that, if you want to be a blacksmith, you're not going to be a blacksmith if when you're doing a forge weld, if you get that molten ball of metal between your thumb and your hammer, if you stop and drop it and dig that out. He said, you finish the weld and then you do that. You worry about that after the weld. Keep going. So I was, I was uh, doing this weld 
and splatting, of course, and, and I felt some. I had a beard at that time, and I felt something like biting at my face as I was finishing up that well. And I put that down, and I looked, and my shirt was on fire, and it was burning my face. <laughs> so, you know, I'm swatting at it, and, and then I'm, I'm done, and I happened to look over, and Francis was over there in his, at his chair, and he was doing this, looking at me. And after I did that, I got the weld and then put the fire out. He just barely nodded his head, like, <laughs> like, like, like maybe there, maybe there was hope for this guy. So, at any rate, yeah, he was a great, great man, and he, uh, again, I'm kind of, I can be kind of a wiseacre at times, and. Um, and he really wasn't, except outside the shop. He had a really good sense of humor. But I don't know what it is about my personality. I kept trying to bug him just enough to get him kind of mad, but not enough to send me home, just because I kind of had to feel like I was in control of some of it, but probably very little of it. So anyway, my background is, is, in, smithing for the, is in smithing for the public at historic sites, primarily. People pay to come in, and I'm the director at Rockledge Ranch Historic Site, and one, we interpret American Indian history, we interpret um, the homestead, we interpret a working ranch, a blacksmith, and then a manor house. So I'm in the shop one time a week, just so I keep my hand in it. Um, we wear the funny clothes, and people do things like butcher animals and farm with horses and do all that kind of thing. So I'm used to having people come in and, and uh, you know, ask questions. And I think Rory, um, the other day, you must have done a public demo because I saw on Facebook where you had mentioned the three most common questions were, do you shoe horses? You know, do you get burned and do you make swords? Yeah. So everybody tends, kids today tend to ask about See, and I was going to say that. See, you're stealing my material. But you're right. Their grandfather was a blacksmith and the uncle was a farmer, just across the board. I don't know. It was never my uncle was a farmer. Or my uncle was a blacksmith and my grandfather was a farmer. Um, so it's um, kind of an interesting thing that they tend to ask that. And I know blacksmiths, we tend to think, oh, no, I'm not a... I don't shoe horses, but I think historically it's fair to admit that a lot of blacksmiths did that, as well as a lot of other things. But when they ask if I make swords, I say, of course I do. And we got to zoom in on this, because there's a little sword. Oh yeah. I made that in one heat right in front of you. You didn't even know what it was, did you? Um, what that is, is, you probably know, it's a duplex nail. And I'll make these and set them out and sell every one I ever make for a dollar a piece. So my daughter's going to school, $50,000 a year, I got a few of these to make. <laughs> so yeah, when they ask, now Rory, you know, if they ask if you make swords, you can whip one right out. Okay, so what I thought I would do in my demo is um, some of the things I do for the when I'm demonstrating for the public. And when I tell my staff to be a good interpreter, there's four things, and it's pretty simple across the board, is number one, you greet with enthusiasm. Yes, yeah, say hello to the person that walks up and let them know that you're approachable. Number two, explain what you're doing. Number three, let them hold it or look at it or use it, however it's, whatever it is. And four, let them ask questions. And I think that probably works as far as interpretation or a demonstration rather at, at the anvil is to let people know what you're doing and you know ask questions show them what it is when they're done and then in some cases I even let people help me yes sure I just want to make sure I get it back now if you notice I even I even beveled that thing so oh you know what before I go on now let me do that after this Another thing, too, is that, and Don Hansen uh, volunteers at the ranch, and he's a great blacksmith, a great interpreter. Um, 
Another thing that we do is you let people see the beginning, middle, and end. Um, unlike a lot of the projects you all do, um, we save those kind of projects for the winter time. We're not open in January, and February, March. So at those times, I'll make sign brackets and fireplace sets for the houses and you know a bunch of stuff like that. Make some things for the general store. But we're, we're big on letting the person see the whole process because not everybody has the attention span that you would hope. And then, of course, you interpret different to different audiences. Little kids that come in, you do different than somebody like you all, maybe that um, if you were to come in, I'd probably ramp it up a little bit. But I'm going to do things like what I do if you were just general public. One of the things I try to do is give, uh, always give credit to people that that I've learned certain things from. And what I'm going to do here is uh, something I learned from a blacksmith down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. His name is uh, Jim Jenkins. I met him probably six years ago. Found him in his shop, and then we went to dinner and talked about blacksmithing, and he told me about this piece. And so I wrote it down in a napkin and came back to the shop and made it, and I thought it was really kind of, kind of a neat demonstration piece. And what's it cost? I think $200 for the conference. I think there were supposed to be five demonstrators, $200. So I don't know if Clay, if his demo, what it was worth, but I, I'm feeling kind of frisky. I think I'm going to do a $43 demo for you guys. <laughs> if you're up for it, I mean. I'll make up for what? For Clay. No, in all seriousness, all seriousness, you guys think when you're 80 years old, you'll be able to do all the things he did yesterday? I mean, that guy went crazy. How many pieces did he do? 15, 20, or 30? This anvil is too short for me, but I'll try to get along with it. Probably like you, I've had to learn how to swing a hammer by doing it wrong and hurting yourself. And so I try to always be conscious of you know, how your body works and, and how to keep from hurting yourself. And I guess I've reached the age where I'm old enough now that I play golf. <laughs> I know, I know. And, So yeah, I hesitated to tell you that I play golf, but um, there is really actually some real correlation between golf and in blacksmith, and strangely enough, in all seriousness, that one thing, I mean, when you're holding a golf club, you don't grip that thing like you're trying to bend the handle. You know, you grip a light, nice grip so that you're, you know, your hands do what they're supposed to do. Um, you keep your elbow close to your side. You don't swing out like this. You know, you follow through. You're using your body. You're, you know, keeping, you're trying to hit what you're looking at. So when I, sometimes when I'm smithing, I think about golf and vice versa. It's kind of weird. The worst thing that can happen is you can go out and play well and then you're hooked. Okay, I'm going to weld this together at that point where I brought it back to itself. I'll, I'll, I guess I won't tell you what this is. I'll let you watch it being made.
Forge welding is something that took me about, I'll stop for a second, it took me probably four months of smithing five days a week trying to get a forge weld and not getting them. Not being successful at all except for maybe once in a while I'll get them to stick instead of weld. And I go back and I read some more and I say, man, I'm doing what he's saying in this book. And it was very frustrating. And people would come in and I wouldn't weld when people were there because I wasn't any good at it. Um, then somebody, I was when I came up to the conference that summer, and I was reading that Alex Beeler book, and he was saying how to weld, but he was using wrought iron. So I was getting into a snowball white heat trying to weld, and it wouldn't weld, and I was doing what he said. And somebody said, you're not using wrought iron, you're using mild steel. And I go, say that again? Uh, and then I thought, okay, that's probably was the key to it, was I was getting it way too hot. And so... I mean, forge welding, I know I heard Francis say that his heart always beat a little faster before every forge weld, and I think that's true. I mean, I've seen him drop a piece in the dirt and pick it back up, knock it off, set it there, and weld it. It's like anything. If you do it enough, then you kind of can adapt to changes that happen when you don't expect them. I think the big the key to getting it a weld is of course getting it hot enough, getting it the right heat. It's really you get that part right, the rest of it just snaps into place, I think. And when you're doing a jump weld or something, then that's a real trick because you're getting two separate pieces at a welding heat can be a challenge. Some of the fondest memories that I have in my lifetime were sitting on Port Francis's porch drinking Coors, watching the sun go down as it was hitting uh, Mount Sopris. He let me stay with him um, the second time. And you can bet that I made that bed right and I hung my towel right and I made sure there was no soap residue in the sink because I had a feeling he was going to go in there and look. And I think he probably did. But it was... Uh, it was really a neat experience. He'd sit in his lazy boy chair that was just covered with coal dust. And he would read or look at correspondence and I'd sit there and, and read the paper or whatever. And it was really a, a really good memory. We weren't even talking, we were just sitting there. And... Again, I was talking about horseshoeing and blacksmithing. And a lot of the historic um, primary sources that I've read, blacksmithing did a lot of shoeing. And again, if they did, if that's all they did, they were farriers, as you know. But I think sometimes we snub our noses at, well, I'm not a, I'm not a horseshoer, I'm a blacksmith. But know that a lot of those fellas were good blacksmiths and they were good horseshoers, too. And I think uh, I just want to mention that because... 
I think it's, as you know, there's probably you know, a lot of guys that started out as farriers that are good blacksmiths. I mean, Frank Turley comes to mind, certainly. I think, Caleb, you were a horseshoer. Mark Asprey was a horseshoer. By the way, I, I know you, along with me, I send out good wishes to Mark Asprey for a speedy and full recovery, so I hope he's, he gets back into it soon. Uh-oh, Scotty should have told me to put my glasses on. I pheasant hunt a lot up in North Dakota and you'll go through some of the old cemeteries or way out in the middle of nowhere and you'll see a lot of hand forged crosses made by blacksmiths. Really interesting to see. Thank you. The old way that I used to make these were done in a way, can I draw? I guess we don't have a board. Yeah, here, 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 here. Oh. Where, I can erase this stuff? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Where I would take a, um, Where should I do this? Over here. I'd take a piece, straight piece, and then I would fold it back over in itself. And then you would make one branch of the heart, and then you would try to do the other one once you got that right. And when you, invariably, when you heated the other side up and brought it around, this, this one would spring or it'd pull apart there or it would do all kinds of weird things. And then you had this real long forge weld. So I always, miss, I always mention Mr. Jenkins when I make these because I think this is a much more interesting way. The thing that I added was that little scroll. About two weeks ago, I was in my shop. My daughter came over and was sitting there watching me. We were just talking. And she looked up on the wall, and one of these was sitting there. And right behind it was a scroll. And that scroll came straight down out of that heart and made that shape. And she said, Dad, that's neat that you're doing that now. And I looked at that. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. So I went over and I looked. And I said, man, that is cool. I'm going to try doing that from now on. So that was an accident to figure that out. So this is what I make these to be um, our hooks. So next I will flatten, excuse me, I'll flatten a couple spots, punch that out. Then we'll cut this and make a hook. This is an example of something that we make and they never stay in the shop. As soon as we make them, people buy them. I'm sorry? What stock did you start with? I think this is 3 8 round. Gordo, where's, do we have a backup plate? Where's Gordo? Just a backup plate so I can punch a hole. Not a cutting plate, but a, I got, yeah, a bolster. Oh. I was hoping you had one that had lots of holes in it. Well, here's one with a small hole. That'll work. Thank you, sir. I talked to 
Paul De Francesco. He's excused from not coming as he had lap band surgery, to, so he wouldn't, couldn't eat so much. And uh, he's going to Italy. He went to Italy with his wife earlier. He didn't go to the band of conference. So he rescued Mark. That Mark was in uh, good spirits from being alive. Thousand dollars damage to his motor, and he's going to be all right. And Paul's going to Alaska next week. Lots of poor schedule. So there's one hole. Of course, you all know it's faster to punch a hole than it is to drill it because you're not going to drill it when it's hot. And if you quench it so you can drill it, you're probably going to ruin your bit as you try to make it go in a piece of metal that invariably will harden when you don't want it to. And then when you want it to, it generally won't. talked about this before, but a lot of times when you're punching holes, it seems to me that if it's not super hot, it shears out better. Sometimes you think you've got to have it yellow hot or something to punch a hole, but my experience is a lot of times I'll even punch it when it's blood red or even kind of dark on something like this, certainly. It's like Clay said yesterday, I mean, we're all taught certain things, and then it's okay for you to kind of do things outside the box to see if it works for you. Um, yeah, like I know Francis would have told me that wasn't hot enough. And like right there when I was flattened in the face of that, he would have said, don't hit that at that color, that heat, it's not hot enough. But you get a finish at a lower heat that you don't at a higher heat, and so that's why I was hitting the back of the piece and letting the anvil kind of planish the front. Matter of fact, this is one of the tools I made with Francis that day. He's got a stamp on it. And Gordo stamped this too. Is Gordo here? You stamped that too with your G when we made that. things that I've just a habit of mine is when I, I'm cutting a piece across the hardy instead of standing here I like standing right there where my hammer is right above it and then of course you never cut all the way through and if you kind of go most of the way around and then break it off you don't get that nasty sharp kind of razor edge because you break it off and then you really don't have to do much more to the piece that's on the ground 
as opposed to cutting most of the way through. And then of course the next step will be this, this is square, then the oct octagonal, and then round. Yeah, it's funny about flux. I know certain people like certain kinds of fluxes and feel funny if they're not using it or if they have clinker in the fire or all those sorts of things. And I mean, again, I think get the heat right, and, and believe me, I miss welds too, but I go in thinking I can make the weld. And the main thing is just, it starts with, I should say, in my opinion, on getting the heat right. And I think back on those four or five months when I was welding and getting it way too hot. That was sure a frustrating time but I'm sure you can relate to times where you really had to earn something and then it was like, okay, that was paying tuition. Now you know it. And I mean, when I was in England, you know, they, they take great pride in not using flux and that's fine. I mean, they use that, what they call metallurgical coke or breeze with the side blast. They don't have a fire pot, big water cooled Bosch and uh, I thought that heat was so clean and intense that it was not a problem to weld without flux. But the thing I think, to me anyway, what I saw was because they didn't use flux, it would take them two heats to make a weld when I thought, well, that should have been one. Francis was pretty big on, you know, you do all the prep before the weld and when you're done with the weld, it should be done. The piece should be done that, on that part of it. It doesn't always happen. But I thought there in England, they kind of intentionally went into it thinking it was going to take two or three heats to finish a weld. It just kind of was something that surprised me after being around Francis. Did you want me to draw the steps on this in case you didn't get that? I can tell you if you'd like. I brought it back to itself and welded it. Then I flattened it, which makes it equal right dead in the middle. So the two halves come out the same, which is what's cool about it. So I brought it around, welded it, flattened it, drew out the point, spread it out, and then put the point back around. I remember one old fella came in when I was first learning how to blacksmith. And uh, he stood there and watched me and I could tell he was kind of judging me. That's one thing. <laughs> when you blacksmith for the public all the time, you always have a guy that comes, you know, there's always people judging you. But this guy was watching me and another person came in and we visited a while and, and they asked me, said, so you're a blacksmith? And I said, well, yeah, I guess. Oh, no, I didn't say I guess. I said yes, because I was being a blacksmith. And that old guy said, just because a cat has kittens in the oven don't mean you call them biscuits. <laughs> I thought, now there's an example of blacksmith getting burned.
Okay, what did I do with my brass brush? Oh, and then I'm big on some of this stuff. Using the brass brush to highlight it, certain parts of it. I kind of like how that looks. And then I put beeswax on a lot of stuff. Let's see, where can I do that where it won't matter where it drips? I'm sorry? Somebody just got to baptize the floor. Okay, good. Yeah, that'll make it a little more grippy. Yeah, it's weird not being able to hear, and people think it's because I've blacksmith for a while, and of course I don't think, I know Clay's kind of hard to hear in, but that's, most people his age kind of are losing their hearing, but I don't think blacksmiths as a rule are any harder hearing than anybody else. Huh? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> he keeps moving around, man, he's a crafty little guy. But um, um, last year, after this conference was over, I talked to Craig May, and he's talking about a, um, a lake above Timberline, Grizzly Lake, on the way up to uh, Independence Pass. And he told me about that, and I thought, you know, I'm going to go up there. And it was a long, really rough road going up there. And then it was, I don't know, maybe four or five mile hike. Maybe not quite that. But there was a part where you're above Timberline, and you're coming across an area pretty steep. And it was before you got up to the top and dropped down in the lake. And I'm walking along. And for a moment, I hear something. I go, what is that sound? And I'm kind of looking. All of a sudden, wham, a rock the size of a suitcase hits right on the trail, right where I was going to walk. I couldn't tell what it was. So not being able to hear for directions is not good. I don't know if we have a rag. I don't see it. Thank you. That's a nice, clean rag, Frank. Thank you. And there now, since I'm thinking about that, there was one other time I almost was killed. <laughs> I'm, at the, I'm at my house, and I live on the ranch there, and it's like 11 o'clock at night. I'm, I'm, I'm just out front. There's a dirt path in front of my house, and uh, my dogs are out kind of walking around. And... and um, all of a sudden, I hear something, and I go, what is that? And I'm kind of looking around. It's dark, of course. And just before it hits me, there's these two people and their horses running as fast as they could go, and they, I barely got out of the way. Would have been a dumb way to die getting hit by a horse. <laughs> anyway, that's that. OK. Any questions about that? Sorry? Oh. Oh, you want me to hold it? That's hard to say. Yeah, I, I've probably made three or four hundred of these. And I just started doing the scroll, so that's a new thing. But yeah, that's why. You got it back. Oh, I got it back. Okay. We can put that and iron in the hat or something. You guys will all be making these tonight. Oh, I wanted to show something about that nail, by the way. Um, a use for a duplex nail, which I think is kind of cool. And I don't know, can you see that vice if we go over there? Athletic tape will hold, huh? Okay. If you take, I don't know how close you can zoom in on this, Carl. Um, if you take a, uh, where's an extra nail? Well, you guys know what a duplex nail looks like. At any rate, if you cut the bottom part, can you see that? If you cut the, the end head off, and then spike the one above that, it makes a really nifty 
little candle spike without getting too crazy about making it. So you can set it in there like that. And of course turn it over. Now what I've done, I've made a monkey tool that is radiused, that kind of fits the shape of the cup. And so then you set this in there so the shoulder seats against the hole. You can put it through the cup and then that on top of that and then peen that down. And something that might take a little work is now really simple. So it's kind of a cool little thing. I won't go ahead and I won't do that unless you want me to. I can do this later and set that in there, maybe in the iron in the hat or whatever. Um, any questions? I make roses, as probably a lot of you do. I think what may make mine a little unique is that I do the whole thing in the fire. I don't use a torch. And recently, I was talking about my daughter getting ready to go to college. She graduated from high school, of course, and I made her a rose, and I made a copper rose, and it was the first one I ever made. It came out really, really cool. And I'm really glad that the first one I made, that she has it. So I thought maybe I would do that. Go ahead, and I'm going to make it out of super thin stuff. Um, I guess that's 3 16 And I'm going to try to weld the uh, rose hip on it and then the leaf. With this fire, it's going to be a little different than I'm used to. But let's go ahead and give it an attempt. And if not, like all the demonstrators, I've already got one of these made. So that we can move forward if it doesn't work. So let me, we'll heat this piece up. What I do is that I round it. I'll round that piece of 3 8 not round it, but I'll set it in this swedge and flatten it. And then that'll be the rose hip. Now I know Mark has a lot of formulas on how you figure out the wrapping and how much you cut and the angles and all that. That's not the way I do it. I'll show you the way I do it. Not that his way is wrong, obviously it's not. But I do mine a little different. I don't think that way. So I'll do the rose hip first and then I'll make the leaf. One of the things I've learned is that when you make the, put the leaf on, you give enough room between the rose hip and the leaf to put that part in the vise so that you can really set the, that top part so that the rose doesn't move. The worst thing is when you make a rose and then the rose is loose because you've had to heat it back up or you put the rose on and then weld the leaf and then the rose got hot and then it's loose. That's, that's probably going to get jammed in there, isn't it? Can we show that over here or it won't take long to do? It's really neat that roses have that rose hip because this style of making a rose is so great for stacking the petals on top that if they didn't have a rose hip, I'm not sure how you would make a rose.
Got a little kink in there. Okay, so I'm going to cut off enough off of that so I can wrap that around and weld it. I don't worry about trying to get it right on the end of the stem. That just gives me a little more to work with. So we'll cut some of that off before we stack the leaves on. Now this weld, you're going to get the stem hotter than the, than the nut, the rose hip, if you don't quench it a few times. If we weren't filming, I'd have that anvil right there. It's a long way to go back and forth. So again, I'm looking at the color of the fire or the piece. Sometimes you can lose it in the fire and you know then that's a good heat that if it blends in with the fire. Then that's an indication that you have a welding heat. Okay, so you can maybe see that welded the piece on there. I don't worry about making it look super neat. It's like a piece of clay. So much about blacksmithing is think about a piece of clay. You can get really worked up about all the different things, and, but in this type of work, you don't need to. You can just get that piece, wrap it on there, and weld it. Now I need to cut some of this off because I need to use my monkey tool to um, set that. This is real important um, to set that a shelf, if you will, for those um, petals to, to sit against. Because otherwise, if you leave it like that, it kind of comes up from when I was forging it this way. So there's not much contact. You will then do the whole thing and set that rivet and you'll, your rose will wiggle and that's just the worst thing. It just ruins everything if that happens. So I'm going to cut some of this off, take a heat and we'll come over and just set that so we have a flat spot on top. That's just real important if you're doing this, if you're making something like this, to not have that 
rose head turn on you. So we'll cut a little bit that a little of that off. Watch yourself. I've got this little tool that this will fit down into that pocket. I made this for quarter inch because I really haven't made roses out of this thin material. So it allows it to roll, which really shouldn't matter. But it's a neat little clamp, very easily made so that it has a little pocket as opposed to one that you drop down in because if you do that you can't leave the leaf on it. This one later when the leaf, imagine the leaf is on there, I can take that in and out. Whereas if you're dropping it down from the top, you can't put the leaf on first, you have to do that after you do the rows and that's when they get loose. Okay, can you see? Something pretty simple there. It has a where we'll stack the leaves against, or the petals, I should say. Okay, so now I'm going to forge a leaf, and then we'll try to do the magic part by forge welding under this thin little piece. So I'm going to set that there, and we'll use a piece that's left over from that first. I kind of take poetic or artistic license, I guess, when I make my leaves. I don't exactly make them like what nature does. I like parts of a rose leaf. One of the things I like is the size, the shape, and the serration on the side, but I kind of fold mine and open them back up so they're not flat. It's not really how nature does it, but it's what I prefer. And again, just like, just like clay, I'm going to point the end and then neck it down and leave the material in the middle so I can spread out to the shape that I want for my leaf. And like Peter Ross talks about, the setup is really the skilled part. If you hit like you want and shape the piece, then if with decent hammer control, it'll come out the shape you want without you doing any file work or changing your hammer angle and bouncing it all over the place. So the first thing I'll do is point the end and a kind of a blunt point and then I'll neck it down. One of the things you don't want to do is get too carried away and make that stem too thin because you can always come back and do that. Right now I don't worry about making that too thin. If you do then later when you're doing various things to this it has a tendency to crack and break. Okay so and again I know probably most of you have made leaves and also this is the way I do with that so I appreciate your attention. Um, 
what I'm going to do is flatten that down and then I'll turn my hammer over and usually you have enough heat to spread out one side. You start in the middle, of course. And you can make that middle as thin as you want. What you try to avoid is making the edge super thin because then it's too foily. And then later when you're trying to cut serrations in it, it'll buckle or fold instead of let you cut into it. So whenever you spread things, I'm sure there's exceptions, but nearly everything I do, you start in the center and then work it from there out. So we have half a leaf. Now of course I'm going to put it in the fire with the thick part down, not the thin part either flat or down because that will burn away before this part gets thick. I hope I didn't scare you all off when I said I couldn't hear out of this ear that you don't want to ask any questions. So don't be shy. Yeah, when I'm smithing at work, it kind of, it's up to me. Yeah. I'm the boss. <laughs> yeah, but there. Yeah, but there are times certainly when I need to make certain things or repair certain things, but. Now what I've tried to do, I don't know if Carl's camera will pick this up, I tried to leave a vein or a raised part down the middle and that's just by controlling the hammer, the peen, just adds a little, you know, I heard a blacksmith once say that, you know, basically what we're doing is capturing light and my wife's a photographer and she'd probably agree with that. So you do that sort of thing and it makes it look a little more interesting than if I had hammered that completely flat. I used to have a die that I would, I would just do the first step, neck it, point it, neck it down, and then smack it in the die and spread it. But they all came out exactly the same, and I didn't like that after a while. So I haven't, haven't used that die. I'm just using the peen of the hammer to um, make some ridges alongside there. Next I'll come in and cut those serrations that I guess all the rose family has serrations. Apple is in the rose family. Oh you know what? Before I do this, I don't have a I don't have a chisel. Is there a I guess I left it in the car. Just a hand chisel if you would, a sharp. Roses have odd number of leaves, one, three, five, seven. I used to do three, but anymore I just, uh, I think the suggestion of a leaf when you're doing it this way works for me anyway. Thank you, sir. Almost grabbed that barehanded. And since that's thin enough, I won't take another heat. We'll just go ahead and cut into that now.
Okay, so I don't know if you can see that. Where do I go? There. Aspen Kind of like an aspen leaf, yeah. Okay, and this is a part that I do that isn't uh, botanically correct, I guess you might say. But I do this just because it pleases me in this next step. I, I'm going to set it in the step of the, of the anvil. I'm going to fold in right at the stem and then open that back up. Take a little heat and I'll open that back up just a little bit. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. Right there at the stem, that's the part that I'm talking about that I did. And if you were able to see, if, the, if it was kind of facing that way like a taco, I was working this way to the, to the opening and this way to the opening, back and forth until it kind of folded up. Okay, I'm going to cut this off and we'll scarf it and then we'll see if you bring me luck. What kind? What kind of luck? I want good luck. Yeah, I should clarify, shouldn't I? I'm going to make this out of, with copper, a copper rose. And I'll be sure to mention where I got those. And Even if he is asleep, I'll mention him. Not very long ago, I changed the way I do this scarf. I still do a celery scarf, but there's a minor thing that I do differently that I think makes a big difference. Okay, what I did there, I, um, maybe, is it better down here, Carl, to see that? It holds down there, yes. Okay. Um, I made a celery scarf, so those of you who haven't done that before, you know how stalks of celery come up, and at the bottom they're kind of concave. What I've done here, I used to just leave that tip blunt. I've drawn that out more to a point, and on a weld on something this thin, I really think that helps blend that into the stem and gets rid of that little foil edge that never seems to want to weld. So 
that little, bringing that to a sharp point, not just thin this way, but that way, I'm sorry, um, makes this blend in if you get, if things work out right, causes the tip of that to weld into the stem, hopefully in one heat. Because a lot of the ones I had were like a chisel end, if you will, and when I welded, it seemed to, half the time not, I wasn't able to get it on the first weld, and then each time you're trying to get it after that, it gets more difficult to do it without making the, the piece so thin that it really isn't, it really isn't right. I have a different way of welding this than maybe other people would. I don't know what I did with my hammer. My little cross pin, there it is right in front of me. I'm gonna do a convenience bend on this. So when I do this weld, what I want to do is bring it out, I'm going to set it right there, and then hit it, and then hopefully turn it over and finish the weld. Other folks I know I've seen, they would get a pair of tongs that would hold both together in the fire. Obviously that will work, that can work. This way though, I get pure heats on both pieces, and it's a little tricky when you bring it out to do this type of weld but it's the way I do it. Frank Turley, what he'll do a lot of times, and I do this, I, I do it the way he does for this type of weld, he'll put borax on and then easy weld. I'll do it on, certainly on the elbow of, that, of the stem because that helps hold the easy weld on there. But generally I don't do that. I don't do both together is what I mean. I use one or the other. I should have come over from the other side, but let's see if we can make it work. You probably have th maybe three hammer blows in this weld. Brought me luck. Thank you. That means a lot coming from you all. It really does. Thank you. Am I? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and I have to be honest. I was thinking I was going to do this out of quarter and not make, not do it out of this thin stuff, but. I figured with clay here, I better do something different because <laughs> you don't know, but he was up at Dan's place when Dan was cutting out these petal, uh, rose petals and Clay then shot me an email and I think Clay's always been slightly disappointed in me and he said something about, well, I was hoping you were going to do traditional joinery. <laughs> That's what he said. And I was thinking on the way up here, Forge Weldon's traditional joinery. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so. Where'd you 
get that coal? I don't know. This isn't mine. I don't. This isn't the kind of coal I'm used to working in. You know, but the thing is, when you do demonstrations and you do stuff in front of the public, you just kind of, that's why I was saying that welding, don't get weirded out that, well, this isn't the coal I'm used to. That's not the flux I'm used to. My anvil's higher. You know, these aren't my tongs. I mean, you kind of learn to, and you know that, Clay. You go so many places demonstrating that you just kind of do what you got to do. And I don't know. I think somebody said this was um, Rod Pickett's. One thing I want to mention is, that especially on something this thin, is when I laid that here to start it, I hit it once to start the weld, then turn it over, and that kept that leaf from acting like a heat sink or the anvil pulling the heat out of the leaf. After I started welding that, I worked at the base, base being the thicker part. I worked here and then came down to the tip. But what was important to remember is once I started that well, I turned it over and was beating on the stem part too because if all I do is beat on the leaf, then of course that's going to thin the leaf. And I, I try to get to where both of those kind of look like they're the same thickness so it looks more natural than if, if I'm beating on one and it's really thin and then it's not going to hold up as well anyway. Okay. I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> This one's out of quarter. It's what? Out of quarter? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I thought you said it was out of order. Okay, so now I'm just going to heat this up and bend the leaf out of the way. And then the next step, um, we'll let that cool for a moment. Maybe I'll come back to this and go on to the next thing and then come back because I want that stem above the rose hip to just normalize because, of course, I'm going to use that as a rivet make that the rivet head, the upset. Most people will in that small stock would have a small block in the forge. You know, and yeah, I was thinking about that. that to put a little anvil just right here. But you guys wouldn't have applauded if I did that. Now, I don't, I don't believe in bruising the metal to make it look like a blacksmith forged it. I've seen people that take ball-peen hammer and beat on it just so it looks like it's been forged. I certainly don't like that. But on this part down here, it's like what Allison was talking about. You forge it, and, and it looks like it makes it look like what it's supposed to. It looks like it was made by a blacksmith. So down here, I sometimes will flatten that slightly. I'm not hitting all over the place as I go. I'm trying to hit it so that there's not a lot of hammer blows that are evident but that it, it, it's forged. So now I just want to check this to make sure that this will fit in here with clearance for the leaf. Okay, so we'll just let that cool for a minute. Were there any questions on that so far? How about moving flash right here? Okay. Is that all right? Is that going to work for you? Yeah. Nice. Oh, you're stout enough to move that sucker. Let me see. Is that out of the way? Enough? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, another project that I do in the shop.
Bottle openers are a big deal. So I have, I was taught this by Greg Price, a blacksmith from back in Virginia. And I call it a snagging because it's kind of a combination snake dragon. The opener is his jaw, his face. If we have time later, I may make one um, the way I make wizards, the way um, I was taught by the Gunter brothers. If we have time, I'll see about making one of those. What's that? Is that, what time is it? 2.45? 2.45? And I go till what? Okay. I was thinking till 3. But Mike wanted to take a break, so let me start this. And then... Okay, I don't know, Carl, if you can get in on that, but you can see the start of the face on that piece, and all I did was use the edge of the anvil. The neat thing about this, you can turn it either way and it comes out fine. Half face blow, half face blow is your friend, you're hitting it right there. And you can either turn it to the left and do the other side, or turn it to the right and do the other side, and it'll come out and start the face on that piece. Okay. I didn't bring the proper backup tool, but Gordo, I think, found something that might be able to work for us. I'm sorry? Well, see, I need something that's going to squeeze this piece so when I hit it, it doesn't slide. See, I need to, I'm going to lay this piece against that, but this is too wide to hold the piece when I'm hitting it. That's why that angle iron, if a piece was welded on it, but let's see what we can do. Tell you what, if you hold this, we'll just do it on the anvil. This will work. I'll, um, I'll let you hold it, and we'll, all I need to do is punch his eyes. It's gonna be the last one I get. No, that's fine. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. I can run around to the other yeah, side. let's come around and we'll just set that other one a little bit. Okay, and then let's take another heat and I'll make his nose. Ordinarily, I would put that in the vise with my tool that allows you to squeeze against that and then work on the face. But, yeah, that'll work. That's the tool. This is a tool that'll work just as well. Because the object, that's the right angle, but this will allow me to squeeze that against the jaws. I'm just fine. Thanks for your help.
you know, one of the things I was just thinking about Francis that I really appreciated about him was I saw him working with people that looked like they were cowboys. I saw him working with people with pink spiky hair. I saw him working with women, kids, old people, and yeah, rings in their nose and all that. And it didn't mean anything to him. And that was really, I thought really he needs to be commended for that because, you know, a man coming from his generation, that had to be pretty strange. But he didn't care. I mean, he really didn't. And I thought that was really neat. And I thought it was really impressive when he sent my wife a letter, he used her hyphenated name. And I know that impressed her, that a guy in late 80s would do that, instead of saying Mrs. Andy Morris, which doesn't fly these days, Clay. Just in case you're sending a letter to my wife. OK, I'm going to put. Uh, like the facsimile of scales on this creature. So I'm going to use that curved hot cut. It's a little bigger than the one I would use. That's a treadle job. Yes, it is. Every time a tool falls off an anvil, I'm reminded of this old Irish guy that was standing there and he said, if you were over the ocean, you'd have lost her. <laughs> okay, so I don't know, can you see that? Little scales in that. Okay, I'm gonna come down and do the two sides. Then we'll cut some of this off. We have a hand crank blower in our shop. It's from the turn of the 20th century. We also have a bellows that is there so people can see, but they're always, they always think that we are using a modern tool when we use the, the bellows, or the blower. But the research I've done said those were invented in 1858, so before the Civil War which of course the Industrial Revolution was in full swing at that time, but people are surprised. Sometimes. Okay, so I'm going to take a heat up here and we'll cut it off and I'm going to draw that out. Yeah, no, it all stays there at the ranch. Yeah.
Oh, that Francis, that Francis said. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and Clay probably can add to this, but Francis told me the time I was here and we were just chatting um, that when he would bid a job, he would stick to that number. So if he said, okay, this gate's going to cost you $8,000, if it cost him less than that to make it, he refunded the money to the client. And he said that always paid off. Now, I don't know if I'd have guts enough to do that. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting, but think about that. You know, you go in and get your Chevy work done, the guy says it's going to cost you $2,400 for a tranny. He try, you know, it comes out $1,900, and he gives, says, you know, it was $19, not $24. You'd say, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to tell everybody about him. Exactly. Thank, thank you. That was the other part. And if you underbid, you eat that. That's tuition. You don't charge more like so many people do today. And then how often does it happen that it comes in, you can do something less than you did? Right? Yeah. That's never happened. Yeah. And see, and you guys, you guys do that kind of work. I don't do that kind of work, so I don't know if that really ever happens. But maybe, yeah, maybe you go in doing more, thinking, well, I can do it for less, and I'll refund, and then my client will be happy. But a lot of times, they said clients that they didn't ask them the price. Right there towards the end, yeah, I just said if you can make it, that would be awful nice. Tell you what, it'll be three o'clock. Yeah, my anvil, I feel really strange leaning over this much. I'd like to stand up straight and hit this way. So I would have that up this high. You mind dragging that over to me? 
No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. <laughs> no, I'm okay. We're going to take a break here in a moment, so I'll be okay. I'm just whining. <laughs> okay, um a lot of times I will use a hot cut and do this, make his mouth, but I'm going to cut it with a hacksaw because I didn't bring the chisel I usually use. Dang it. But this will make it work. I was working down there intentionally, so this is hot, obviously, but it shouldn't, shouldn't impact my hacksaw. So we're almost done. I'm trying to get this done before three and they tell me we're going to take a break. My vice in my shop is in the ground about that deep. I don't like a vice that moves. No, we'll go ahead and we'll saw it. Actually, it's soft. You see this thing cut. Could you stand there so this doesn't wiggle? I hate to break this blade. Somebody has a Francis story, they'd be a good time to tell it. <laughs> We're almost there. Okay. Shoo. No, I think we're okay. Thank you. Oh. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. There's the bridge tool.
do one thing here. Wait, that's the one I just used. Oh well. There's one on the floor right there. That's the one, thank you. Okay. Um, I love these tongue clips. There's so much work that I do that you need to hold with a clip because you're doing something with your other two hands. Well, with your two hands. Um, <laughs> that without being able to hold it there, you're, I don't know how you'd do it. Also, one thing that I try never to do is to leave the piece holding the metal in the fire. Right here, it's doing that, but it's far enough back that it's not getting hot. I mean, it's getting hot, but not orange. I generally never, the only reason I'm doing that right now is because the tong clip is on there. I generally never leave the tong on the piece. I, if you bank your fire right, it won't fall down in there. And that keeps you from messing up a bunch of tongs. I'm trying to do that so I'm not blocking his camera. <laughs> You know what, Clay, would you do me the honor of... Where's Clay? Here. He's gone? Where? Could you, I guess, just use that little hammer and you can hit that and we'll see. Should I take another heat on that? Probably should, shouldn't I? Black heat is harder, more brittle. Right. That was still a little bit twinge. There was still come some color, but where I wanted to stamp it, probably not enough.
it's not super hot, but I think it'll work for us. Thank you. Did I get it? Let's try it once more. There you got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's our little snagging. <laughs> 